Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio. Brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta, OnPay is the top rated payroll and HR software anywhere. Get one month free at OnPay.com. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today we have with us James Lewis with 1110 Innovation Partners. Welcome, James. Thanks for having me, Lee. Glad to be here. Well, I'm excited to learn what you're up to. Tell us a little bit about 1110. How are you serving folks? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 1110 is a it's a professional services organization, and uh, we really exist to help healthcare systems, Fortune 500 companies, and strategies drive innovation in healthcare. Um, so we are powering their innovation and venture programs, and uh, we operate programs like the Emory Healthcare Innovation Hub. So uh, what's your backstory? How'd you get in this line of work? Yeah, absolutely. So there's really two paths to this backstory. So the, the first is really the professional path. Uh, my background is in consulting and venture capital. So I started my career uh, helping uh, government organizations build innovation programs where they were working with private sector companies and, and was really fascinated by that collaborative approach uh, and, and working with these government in- industries to solve complex problems. Uh, and then on the personal side, you know, a lot of folks ask why we are so focused on healthcare. I was actually diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was 15 years old and for many years really struggled with engaging with the healthcare system, whether it was uh, going to a bunch of different doctor's appointments or uh, getting prescriptions filled or getting blood tests or having to get my medication and different things. So, um, you know, through that experience in venture capital and consulting, uh, really wanted to figure out what my role was to help improve the healthcare uh, industry. And what that ended up being is creating this user-friendly and efficient innovation ecosystem uh, to help digital healthcare companies get their solutions up and running and ultimately get adopted and, and rolled out. So uh, very passionate about the work that we do. And, uh, and that's evolved to being, um, you know, a very successful program where we're helping a lot of big clients drive their digital health strategy. But you're helping clients in a variety of ways. This isn't just kind of a one size fits all. You have a variety of services that, um, serve different folks at different points in their kind of evolution, right? Yeah. So there's two layers, the way we help organizations. So all organizations that partner with us, we build them what we call their innovation roadmap. And that is really helping them come with a cohesive strategy across their organization on how they are innovating or how they're investing in early stage ideas or, um, or companies. And, you know, the stats that really drive that we always share is McKinsey did a study recently and it said 89% of C-suite healthcare executives say they need a formal innovation ecosystem strategy, but over 60% don't know where to begin. So really our lead into organizations is we are that point on where to begin. Uh, Once we do that innovation roadmap, we have a full service research strategy, operations, design, development, and engineering lab. We operate a lab. It's it's here in Atlanta, up in Sandy Springs. And we're able to take ideas and concepts and bring them to life, whether it be designing and building a new remote patient monitoring sensor or building a new EMR integrated application. Uh, so we are really a custom program uh, that can that can provide the resources needed for our our customers to bring their innovation ideas to life. So now, um, but you also play nicely with, like, say, I, I might be a a healthcare system, so I want to know everything that's going on uh, from an innovation standpoint, or I want to kind of foster innovation in my own organization. You can help solve there. But I also, if I am, say, a uh, medical device company and I want to test this and see if this is going to work, you have a, you can help me there as well, right? That's exactly right. Our concept, we call it demand-driven innovation, and that is really innovating with the end users and not separately for the end users. What that means is when we took a look at what was going on in healthcare, we found that there was a lot of incubator and accelerator programs that would select a cohort of companies 
and then look for pilots and partnerships where they can validate those technologies. We actually flipped the script on that model. So we have several healthcare partner, healthcare system partners where we go in and interview their clinicians, their administrators, their nurses, and we map out the current patient journey, the way the provider is delivering care, the systems and technology they're using. And we funnel all that up into investable problem statements. And then we work with our corporate partner ecosystem to take those problem statements and make and, and find out really digestible opportunities and solutions that can be solved most of the time with multiple industry partners like a health IT company and a payer or a pharma company and a remote patient monitoring sensor. So the, the advantage we have is that we are solving real world problems that the healthcare system has identified. And, and 60% of the time, we end up placing a pilot with those organizations so that we have real world data on how those solutions uh, improve cost, improve quality, uh, make the provider's uh, experience better, um, and ultimately just improve the care process for both the patient and the provider. Now, do you find that having done this uh, for a minute now that you that the, in a lot of organizations, uh, there's an old story like called Acres of Diamonds, where there's acres of diamonds in your backyard that they might have solutions just around them that they're they don't have a mechanism to kind of have it bubble up and be kind of productized. I think that's spot on, especially in complex industries like healthcare. Sometimes the value differentiation of getting your product or solution adopted is not necessarily the quality of your product or your solution or your technology. It's actually the ability for that solution to be integrated and for you to have tangible real world data about how that makes an impact for the end user. So we are seeing with many healthcare systems that they have tangible problems and they have existing solutions that they're not fully utilizing. Uh, so absolutely, we're seeing things in the backyard. The second part of that is in healthcare, it's important that solutions work across the value chain, meaning that it's not just a healthcare system or a clinician that needs to adopt the solution. You know, a technology solution has to have a perspective on how it's reimbursed which means a payer may need to be involved to think about the cost of care implications. So part of the value we bring is that when we do an innovation assessment, we can take a concept like telehealth or remote patient monitoring or digital therapeutics, and we can say, what are the impl implications to the healthcare system? What are the implications to pharma life science players? What are the implications to payers and health plans? And we can then take those solutions and say, hey, not only these, is this the features and functions you need in this solution, this is really the business model you need to get this adopted by the right parties. And typically, that's a complex business model that is very hard to navigate uh, for companies of all sizes. Now, did the pandemic, um, the way that it came on so fast and furiously, and the disruption that it had across you know, all industries, but especially healthcare, was that kind of a net positive for you in terms of this forced people to take hard looks at systems and they had to get certain things? They knew that, uh, you know, it was like the, the tide went out and, and then you could tell who had no clothes on or not. Like it was, and it created a lot of uh, stress on the system. And you can tell the systems that were better put together than others. And I would imagine this would create a, a big opportunity for your folks because of your services you're providing. Well, Lee, I'll, I'll tell you, first, I'll tell you a story. So like many of your other guests, uh, when the pandemic hit, you know, we were about two years into the business and we're in full fledged growth mode. So had invested a lot in resources and we're really trying to get off the ground to make sure that the service we were providing to the industry was indeed something that was needed. And so I was very worried that the pandemic and the changes on the workforce would actually cannibalize the need for our service because these innovation budgets might get cut given the focus on COVID. What actually happened is we were very much in the right place at the right time. So in, in March 2020, when the shutdown started to happen and COVID started to really ramp up, you know, we had just cut the ribbon 
uh, on the world's first 5G innovation lab, which is our innovation lab up in Sandy Springs in a partnership with Emory and Verizon. So we had all the tools and assets and resources needed to not only build digital, custom digital health tools, but to actually implement those into real world settings through distribution relationships with Emory and other healthcare systems, as well as payers and life science companies. So we were very much in the right place in the right time. And all of our existing clients pretty much doubled down on their digital health efforts. And we were able to sign a lot more clients who, uh, who we served as kind of their digital health partner to take to build new solutions and take their existing solutions to market. So, you know, now more than ever, digital health is critical. And, um, and, and we are that ecosystem that enables digital health for many of our client partners. So we were very lucky in that we were one of the industries that, uh, that upticked uh, during the pandemic. And, um, and it's been, you know, quite a, quite a rewarding process to see many of the things we're working on make an impact on, uh, on healthcare. Now, um, Atlanta is kind of a hub for this kind of healthcare innovation, but a lot of folks may be not aware of that. Can you share a little bit about what makes Atlanta such a great place to do business if you're in, in the healthcare innovation business? Yeah, it is kind of the hidden gem, although I would argue that now it's not hidden anymore, that Atlanta is certainly uh, having a moment and in, in really accelerating to be an innovation ecosystem in many industries and not just healthcare, but but fintech and, and media and a lot of the other things we're seeing. But for healthcare specifically, um, you know, Emory and Wellstar and Piedmont are some of the most forward-thinking healthcare delivery systems. And Emory and Wellstar are great uh, academic medical centers. Um, you couple that with some of the engineering talent we're able to get with Georgia Tech and then the support we have from many of the corporate partners in town who, uh, who are charged with making sure healthcare is delivered well to their employees. Um, it creates a very good ecosystem. Beyond that, uh, the startup ecosystem of companies starting healthcare IT companies that are willing to try new things and adapt um, and do what needs to be done to make sure their solution is, is making an impact on care and being adopted by these healthcare systems. So we've been very fortunate to be in an ecosystem where Many of the corporate partners we worked with who are not headquartered here want to have a footprint here. Um, another thing to note about Atlanta that is very interesting in healthcare, a lot of technologies that are rolled out in healthcare, they have to be piloted and you really have to look at how it makes an impact in care. And Atlanta, from a diversity perspective, is a microcosm of, a, of what the diversity makeup is of the, the entire nation. So, we're able to take technologies that improve things like rural health um, and, and, and try those here in Atlanta and with some of the rural Georgia counties, and that is reflective of the rest of the nation. So a lot of companies want to invest in Atlanta and have a footprint here because it is, a, uh, it is an early indicator of success. So, um, so can't say enough great things about Atlanta um, from the support that the local government and the Metro Atlanta Chamber and the academic institutions and, and obviously, our marquee relationship is with the Emory Healthcare Innovation Hub uh, that is committed to invest in and break down the barriers for healthcare innovation. So now, can you talk a little bit about how partnering with an organization like yours or yours specifically can accelerate some of um, kind of the going from idea to actually, you know, productized how how working with you can accelerate that and find those hidden gems that, like we said earlier, might be just sitting right there that just are underutilized. Yeah. So there's a use case that I like to say, and it goes back way, you know, I don't have the specific years, but the stethoscope used to be a tube where folks listen to the heart and actually put their ear up to this tube and listen to folks' heart. And then in the, in the uh, 50s and 60s, it evolved into the technology that you have today where, you know, you see the stethoscope and that is certainly an iconic symbol for a doctor. Um, but in the early, the early two thousands, the digital stethoscope was created. And that is where you can listen to heart rate and monitor heart rate from remote locations using a digital stethoscope. But as you know, uh, many of you, you've never seen your clinician using a digital stethoscope. And the reason is, is because, the adoption and the scalability in an industry like healthcare, it's very hard 
uh, for folks to to change their existing practices. The other underlying concept of that story is that innovation used to take hundreds of years and then tens of years. And now corporates are charged with innovating every quarter. Um, so they need to invest in supplemental resources to not only think about innovation, but to also rapidly bring that innovation to life and be committed to, in to innovation. So the role that our organization plays is we create an internal innovation and venture practice in your organization where like HR and accounting, we're charged with working with the business units, constantly thinking through how they transform their product or their business model, and then testing those products and business models in real world environments with partners. Um, that's something that is very hard to do with internal resources, but it's something our organization is wired to do. Uh, and it's a service that is that is catching on very quickly. And, and um, many corporate partners are charged with what is their external innovation strategy and how are they working with ecosystem partners to test that. Now, uh, can you talk a little bit about what trends you're seeing in healthcare? Uh, for me, as a lay person and not intimately involved in the healthcare industry, I see things like an Apple Watch or I use a Whoop fitness band that's tracking all kinds of um, kind of medical information on me. And it's just, it, it ends with me though. It isn't going to my doctor. Do you see a time when all of this is just kind of part of the interaction with your doctor is that they're going to kind of know where you're at and if there's, they can catch things a lot earlier with more of these devices that are, that just individuals are using nowadays? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, with COVID, there's a lot of trends that have been accelerated in healthcare. The one you touched on, the prolification of data, uh, that's really driven by providers seeking to get more data and, and uh, for lack of a better word, prescribing remote patient monitoring devices that collect data. But it's also driven by more consumer engagement on the wellness side, like the Apple Watch or the Whoop, to collect more data. But the major trend that needs to be solved is how do we harness that data and actually make it usable and digestible for health insights? Um, so there's a lot of projects we work on that is not only figuring out how to collect and organize that data, but using artificial intelligence to associate that data with med medical records and to make recommendations on that data for healthy lifestyle changes. The span of those types of projects go all the way into radiology and diagnostic imaging, where you can use technologies like x-ray and motion to understand where there might be wear and tear on a joint um, that you might be able to fix with yoga instead of a procedure, all the way down to fitness trackers like the Apple Watch that have uh, EKGs to monitor heart activity and catch AFib before a provider might be able to see it. Uh, beyond that data trend, I mean, we are seeing a massive adoption of remote health uh, in various ways. We do believe that the provider is always going to be critical in the center of care delivery, but we believe technologies that enable that provider to be more of a coach to the patient and to guide that patient to better decisions um, is going to be the underlying factor that drives that adoption of technology. Applying it back to myself, I mentioned my journey with Crohn's disease, and, and that is really my prime experience of, of, uh, of my engagement with the healthcare system. But I, but I always wish during that journey that I could engage with, uh, with the clinicians as a coach. I wish they could say, hey, you should think about what you're eating today, or you're experiencing this sy symptoms, this is probably because of this you know, cause and effect relationship. Um, that is what we're seeing today that the, the healthcare provider and the enabling resources like nurses are, are being more of a coach to patients and they're going to need to use technology as tools to enable that relationship. So that's what we're really passionate about. And, uh, and beyond that, we're passionate about tools that make the provider's life easier because they're asked to do a lot of things in a very stressful environment. And the more they can lean on technology tools to help with what they're doing, uh, the more they're going to be able to focus on the outcomes in the patient itself. Now, do you find with this advent of all the data that is being collected, and a lot of this is, you know, I have a device, my doctor can see my device, or maybe I permission them to share my information with my doctor. Um, is it also... Are we missing out an opportunity? And I know privacy is a huge issue and, and, and that's probably what's holding this back until we thread this needle. But like, like Google knows by searches, if there's kind of the flu, 
because a certain percentage of the population is searching for that in a given area and they could bubble up some information that could help the entire community if that was more transparent and more available to the medical profession. Is there any work in that area that's being done to kind of capture population information in a way that um, makes it anonymous so that you know when there is a pandemic or something like that is happening in a region that maybe we can get ahead of it a little bit? There is. There, that's a great question. There's a lot of, of work in that space being done. I'll, I'll highlight a couple of things. The, the macro space that you're talking about is really using impressions data and social determinants of health data to better target where campaigns are for various conditions or various therapeutics. There's, there's two companies we work with, ShareCare here in town, uh, founded by Jeff Arnold and recently you know, went public and they are really making an impact in care. They have a great capability where they're building community well-being indexes uh, using social determinants of health data, data like literacy, uh, income rate, um, how folks are engaging in their mobile devices. And they can start to say, what is the probability that you're going to have, um, you know, uh, disparate health outcomes relative to someone who has a different social determinants of health makeup? What that's allowing uh, the incumbent players to do, like healthcare systems, community health hospitals, payers, and life sciences companies, is they're actually able to target those resources to that population and proactively go after some of those social determinants of health indicators and improve those over time. Uh, another partner we work with very closely is Verizon, where they have 4 billion impressions a day, and they think a lot about, they don't actually sell data and, and use your data for various things, but they like to extract insights that can be valuable. So we think a lot about what are those insights and how you can apply those. The way that is going to work in the space is there's a lot of incumbents that are building clinical tools. So think of applications that clinicians are using that are embedded in the EMR that help them diagnose and make better decisions. So that might be a, di a diabetes application that helps them say, hey, this patient is at risk for diabetes. Um, or it might be a, a chronic kidney disease application to say, hey, based on their labs, this person is at risk for uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, tying that data to this impressions and social determinants of health data so that folks can start to proactively understand who those populations are and invest in the resources to prevent some of these illnesses that truly are prevented. Um, that is truly the innovation in the space. And we're working on several projects like that where we take a community area and the community hospitals within and empower the healthcare systems and the community with the tools to make an impact on care. Well, James, what uh, do you need more of? How can we help you? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We uh, look, we are very passionate about scaling our business and adding more healthcare system partners so that our ecosystem can be more complete to deliver more complete solutions there's really two things that we're actively trying to do. One is expand to uh, more healthcare systems and corporate partners so that we can have a more complete solution. Because as I mentioned, 60% of our projects are where multiple partners in our ecosystem are working together. Uh, the second thing that I did not talk too much about is that we actually do incubate solutions. So when we see a major gap in the market, we are actually spinning up companies uh, raising capital on those companies, submitting the regulatory approvals and taking those uh, companies to market. An example of that is a company called AngioCloud, and it's a 3D imaging platform that does uh, e-consultations and pre-surgical planning for vascular procedures. Um, so we are about to actively start raising capital on that. Uh, and what I would say is, you know, Atlanta has been very good to us there are several uh, entrepreneurs and investors that are helping prop up the ecosystem. So I think as long as everybody continues to do their part to be passionate about Atlanta and make sure that the um, the ecosystem is growing, I think uh, you know rising tide raises everybody. Uh, we benefit from that. So um, so that would be my answer to that. And certainly we just uh, we just appreciate everything you do and and that the ecosystem does as a whole. So you're looking for startups. Uh, to fund or you you handpick your own startups and then you're just looking to get them more resources? Yeah. If you are a healthcare startup looking to form partnerships with corporate partners or healthcare systems, we are interested in 
uh, both investing in those and supporting those. Uh, and then if you're an entrepreneur with an idea, we have an incubation lab. So we're interested to partner with you to kind of get those ideas off the ground. So those are kind of the tangible ways to engage with us uh, to, to start the process. Well, again, congratulations on all the success. If somebody wants to connect with you in any of those areas, uh, what's the website? So the website is uh, www.1110.com or 11ten.com. Uh, and they can shoot us an email or their pitch decks or any other relevant information at info at 11ten.com. Well, James, thank you again for sharing your story today. You're doing important work and we appreciate you. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate everything you do and look forward to catching up again soon. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio. Today's episode of Atlanta Business Radio is brought to you by OnPay, Atlanta's new standard in payroll. To learn more and get your first month free, go to onpay.com.